Okay, so for chapter four, this chapter is titled Balance and Sequentiality in Bayesian Analysis. So basically what we are learning about is the balance between how much influence the prior or the data have on the posterior. So that's what we're gonna do um, most of the for most of the of the hour that we're gonna be here for this book club. We, uh, we will see how our choice of prior model, the features of our data, how are impacting the posterior, which is the answer that we're looking for, right? Like that's going to be the posterior conclusions that we are going to arrive. So then um, the last part, which is just five minutes or something like that, we're going to uh, understand what this sequentiality in Bayesian analysis means, um, which is more or less how the posterior model evolves as it's updated with, with new data. So it's not like we do one analysis and then it stops. No, we can continue as, a, as this sequentiality um, principle dictates. So let's begin with this balance between the prior and the data and how much they influence the posterior. So if we, let's just remember, let's just start by remembering the Bayesian um, equation. So we're gonna have here the posterior probability of H given the evidence. So this is gonna be, um, when I say evidence, I mean the data, right, that we have. And this is going to be, the, this side of the equation is going to be what we know as the posterior. So every time I'm talking about the posterior, this is what I mean. And that is, um, basically understood as the product of the prior probability and the likelihood of the evidence, E or the data, sometimes it's um, other books use D for data, and having said that the hypothesis that they are trying to understand is true, right? So this is like the frequentist portion of it. So this is that likelihood. And then this is divided by the prior probability that the evidence itself is true. But as we saw in chapter, I think it was two or three, I'm not really sure. Really what we see is that these two are sort of equivalent to just, just these two are equivalent to the posterior. So then we really, by using the um, MCMC and other um, parameters, that's how we are, uh, sort of um, bypassing this prior probability, uh, which is in the denominator, right, to, in order to answer the posterior. Anyway, that's a whole thing that I, I'm, I'm not even sure if I understand that part as of yet, but I guess we're going to see it in chapter seven. The thing that we're trying to say here is that remember that the posterior, in order to get the posterior, right, we're doing, um, we're working with a prior and with the likelihood. That's basically the two components that are gonna help us understand the posterior. That's the whole thing. The whole Bayesian analysis is basically that. Choosing the prior and sort of doing the equation for the likelihood. So the chapter begins with an example of three friends that are labeled as one is a feminist, another one is a clueless, person, which means that they're very naive, maybe, and an optimist who tends to see things in a lighter light, or they tend to see things that are, I guess, much more positive than what they are in reality, right? And these three friends are discussing the proportion, which is um, notated with pi, the proportion of recent movies that pass the Bechtel or Bechtel test, I don't know how you say that in in English, which this test, what it says is the representation of women in film. Well, they have a, like a score to assign to a movie and say, well, you have a score of one, a score of five, in saying that the higher the score, it's because you have um, a higher representation of women in your film as opposed to being a one or a zero, right? Where there's, it's like a, there are no women in the movie. The topics that they're discussing have nothing to do with women. And 
you cannot even see one single woman on the field, right? So, um, so anyway, that's uh, so that's what the the example begins with, and when we um, when they start discussing these films, the they assign a prior, which is like their understanding of how these Bechdel test or Bechdel test would work in a set of movies or recent movies in real life. Like, how do you think women are represented in films based on these Bechdel test? So the the friends are all three friends, and obviously this is like for us to sort of gauge our understanding of uh, each one of them. So they're not telling us exactly which one belongs to each prior probability. So that's sort of what we are doing right now. Let me just zoom in a little bit so that we can see this better. And basically what they're saying is that for, the, for this one, the prior understanding of what is the proportion of uh, recent movies that pass the Bechdel test, is it 100% or is it going to be no, actually less? I think they're going to be like maybe just 20% of the movies are going to pass this Bechdel test and are going to say yes, they represent women. No, I just think it's going to be just like 20%. So if we start looking at each one of these priors and try to assign each one to each one our friends, we can see, for example, that this one that has a very flat distribution, the beta distribution, um, it's basically saying or it's basically assigning the same probability um, across all. Uh, uh, so it doesn't matter really. They're just saying the pro the proportion of recent movies that are going to pass the Bechdel test is going to be the same. It's, it's a uniform uh, distribution in that sense. So basically, they're placing equal possibility on all values between 0 and 1, which, in other words, could be understood as, as I really don't know. I, I really don't know. It could be that 0% of the movies have um, pass the Bechdel test or 100% of the movies, because I don't know, let me just assign a uniform prior. So, or an uninformative prior, I should say. So there's, they are using the beta distribution because beta works with proportions. So because our answer has to be, what's the proportion of recent movies, it's either 0 0.25, 0 0.75, 1, can be more than one, it can be less than zero. So that's because it's constrained between zero and one. That's why we're using the beta distribution to sort of understand this. And a beta distribution with an alpha of one and a beta of one looks like this. That's what we saw in the previous chapter, I think. So when we move to the other one, we're saying that now the beta distribution has an alpha of five and a, and a beta of 11 sort of looks like this. And it's saying that the majority of that proportion of movies are going to be around 0.30. So they're saying 30% mm, of the movies or 0.3, uh, the proportion of, of movies that are going to pass the Bechdel test is going to be 0.3. And the, the last one, the um, this distribution, again, with the beta distribution, with an alpha 14 and a beta 1, it's saying that the majority of that proportion is going to be between 0.75 and 1. So they're basically saying 100% of the tests are going to pass the Bechdel test. So this one is saying, I don't know, it could be either that the that 0 or 100% of the movies pass the test. This one is saying, mm -mm, I think it's going to be around 0.3. Like 30% of the movies are going to pass the Bechdel test. And this one, the last one, is saying 100% of the movies are going to pass the Bechdel test. So if we assign it, we can see that the optimist is going to be the last one because they're saying, yes, everything is great. And we are just going to pass in all the recent movies, 
represent women in, 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 in films. The clueless one is going to be, I don't know. I don't know what we're doing, so let me just say it's going to be the same between zero and one because I don't know. Whereas the feminist is going to be a little more mm, realistic and she's going to say, no, I think it's going to be 30%. So that's how we sort of understand these priors. The three friends agreed to review a sample of recent movies, forgive me for the typo here, and record the number of movies that pass the Bechdel test. Here we understand that Y is the number of successes in a fixed number of independent trials, which is why we're saying binomial here. So because they're going to be either a success or not a success, right? When they see a movie, which is going to be Y, um, well, it's not going to be, yeah, it's going to be little Y, I suppose. And then you're going to say how many, uh, uh, well, this movie that I'm seeing, does it pass the test or does it not pass the test? Is it a success or a failure? And that's why it's a binomial, right? Because if it's a success, then, um, then we, we mark it as a success. If it's a fail, then we mark it as a fail. So what it's saying here is the binomial distribution on N independent trials, which is going to be, um, if they decide to review 20 movies, N is going to be 20, right? And then pi is going to be the proportion of successes or the probability of successes in the movie. And that proportion or that probability, it's not a proportion, I should say, that probability, the probability of successes um, it's going to be described as a beta distribution with, uh, with two parameters, alpha and beta. And again, we say beta because it goes from zero to one, is constrained between zero and one, and beta distributions work with that kind of data. So that's more or less like how our um, model would look like if we, if, when they start to record uh, the data, right? This is what their priors look like. Each one is going to have a different prior, and this is what the um, how the equations will look like or how the model will look like. So then, what happens or what do we do? Different priors mean different posteriors. So we're going to have, or the authors of this book, right? They create, or they um, we're going to keep working, I should say, with each one of them friends using their different priors and how the how that is going to affect the posterior. So the more certain the prior information, so the more uh, the less variable, the smallest the variability is in the prior, then that is going to be known as an informative prior. So when we have a prior that is not highly variable that has high certainty that is what we consider an informative prior and that is exactly what the optimist friend had uh, because the pro the variability whoops here the variability here in the optimist friend is very, very so the variability is going to be how wide right the 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 curve is going to be here if it's going to be not too variable or less variable is going to be very, very thin. And when it starts to widen out, then that means it's going to be very variable. So, um, so the optimist friend, that's what we would consider the smaller or a certain prior, which is an informative prior, which reflects specific information about the unknown variable with high certainty, which means low variability. The more vague the prior information, the greater the prior variability, which is the complete opposite, right? So now we have what our clueless friend was saying. And you can see here that it's super wide because it's very variable. We really don't have a lot of certainty around a specific value. And vague priors are understood as vague or diffuse prior, which reflect little specific information about the unknown variable. A flat prior, which assigns equal prior plausibility to all possible values of the variable, is a special case of a vague prior, right? Um, so, so that's more or less what we're going to be working with. So it's either an informative prior, which is going to give us a lot of information because it has 
um, high certainty, or we're going to have a vague prior or uninformative prior. I've also, I've also heard it like that. Vague prior or uninformative prior, which is going to have, it's going to give us very little information. It's going to be very variable, or it's going to have a lot of variability. So how will the different priors will influence the posterior conclusions of the friend or the results that we're going to get? And to answer this question, the way they the authors managed to answer these questions or to show us how the priors affect the posteriors is that they collected some data, right? So we have the prior portion and now the D at data that they're collecting. So they reviewed 20 recent movies picked at random. And we're going to have 20 for each one of the friends. So this is just um, sort of how the data would look like. This is just um, three rows, but remember, we, we have to have 20 rows, right? This is just the top three. Um, so for the year 2005, they reviewed King Kong and they saw that they failed the Bechtel test. For 1983, for the movie Flashdance, they say that they passed the Bechtel test. And like that, they did it with 20 different recent movies, which what's recent, right? Because this is from 1983. I don't know how recent that is considered, but you know, to each their own. So then what they did is they tabulated how many fails and how many passes they got out of these 20. And that's what we see here. So out of our 20 movies that they reviewed, 11 failed the test and nine passed the test. So when we see this in a proportion, we can say that 55% or only 0.55 of the movies failed the test. Well, not on the majority, right? Failed the test. So here on this figure, let's just zoom in a little bit. Here we can see that uh, the figure below, can I get rid of this? Yes. So this figure is going to display the priors and the data, which is the likelihood, right? So it's going to display both of them and um, for each one. So for the feminist, for the clueless, and for the optimist. So because we're working with the same data, I thought it was different for each one, but I guess we're all working with the same data. All friends are working with the same data. The only thing that's varying is, is the prior. So for the feminist, we can see here that the prior is going to be here in, um, in yellow and the data that they collected is going to be in blue. And the same thing can it be for the clueless and for the optimist. So based on these two things, obviously we have to put them into the model and mathematically and formally obtain the posterior, but we're going to skip that for now. And we're only just going to see the results as in because we haven't seen exactly how to do this or how to compute this. So let's just go to the results and see exactly what happens. So here we can see the prior, how they would look like. For the first one, we're saying um, for the feminist. So for this one, here we're going to have a posterior of. Um, 14 and 22, and this is how the prior looks like with an alpha of 5 and a beta of 11. These are the parameters that are giving the shape of the distribution, right? This is for the clueless um, friend, and this is for the optimist. The results can be seen here. And the posterior now, which is just basically what we went from this to this by adding that posterior. And what we see here is the, um, the posterior, which is our answer, right? How, which is in green, how does it compare to the likelihood of the prior? And we can see that basically for the, for the feminist, it's right here around, what's this? I would say that's point, maybe that's point three. And where the likelihood was estimating, 
0.45 maybe, and the prior was estimating close to 0.27 or something like that. For the clueless, I don't know where the likelihood is really here. Maybe it's on the same uh, as in the posterior. I don't know what happened here. But for the optimist, we can also see that there's like um there's not much overlap between the likelihood and the posterior, which means they're not very similar, right? So the the, the data or the likelihood is not really that similar to the posterior. Okay, so let's zoom in here a little bit. So what we see here is basically the effect of the prior, the weight of the prior on influencing the posterior. When we have, the only thing is, I don't know where, where the posterior is here. Let me check the book. Um, I don't know what happened. Here, maybe. Did you guys read that part? I just, I don't really remember what happened here. Yeah, um, they mentioned that there the posterior is equal to the likelihood. So you can't see ah, it because they're overlapping. That's what, okay, thank you, thank you, Diane. Yeah. Okay, so then that's exactly uh, what's happening here. And the more, the more the data or the more the likelihood is overlapping with the posterior, that means that the data is exactly what affected the posterior, not the prior, right? So that's that's exactly what's happening here. If the, the, the likelihood, as opposed to the prior, had so much weight on the posterior that that's what, why they end up looking exactly the same, whereas that's not exactly what happens on the other two cases, right? When each one of them, the posterior, um, is different from the likelihood, a little bit different from the likelihood, because it's taking some information from the prior and a little bit from the likelihood, which is exactly what happens here, right? It's right in the middle. And here, well, it's right in the middle too. The posterior is right in the middle between the data and the prior, but it's more, much more closer to the feminist one. And this one, um, so this is, this is, this posterior, you can actually see the influence or the effect from both the data and the, and the prior, I suppose, here. I don't know if I'm over-explaining things, you guys. I always over-explain. But, um, but that's, that's why I loved this book and understanding these concepts, because I've, I've read them in other books. But because they don't always have like figures like this or such a, an easy-to-understand example, I, I think, that's why Sometimes it's not that easy to understand this concept. So, okay, so anyway, here what we see is that um, the posterior is going to be influenced by the prior. And uninformative priors have very little effect on the posterior. Uninformative or uniform priors like this one, right? Like the beta 1 1. Okay, if we move now to seeing, okay, so we know that the prior is going to affect the posterior. How is the data affecting the posterior when we leave a prior um, untouched? Like, let's say all of the friends have the same prior now, and the only thing that we're going to vary now is going to be the data. So let's vary sample sizes. So what they did is now they're working on um are we still working yeah i think we're still working with the movies because I sometimes they changed but i think they're still working on the movies but now they're collecting data using only the um the optimist prior or the beta that is saying that practically a hundred percent of the movies are gonna have a representation of women and what they are doing is that the first friend, Mortisa, I suppose that's how you say that name, they're just going to have a sample size of 13 movies. And out of those 13 movies, six were a pass. Six of those movies passed the Bechdel test. Then we move to Nadine or Nadine. 
we increase a little bit the sample size. So now we go from 63 from 13, right? Previously, now we have 63. And out of those 63, 29 pass the test, which is seen here in the uh, blue line, right? The blue curve. And now we go to Ursula and she collected much more data. She analyzed 99 films. And out of those 99 films, 46 passed the test. So basically, um, what we see here is that all of them had the same prior. All of them had the same uh, pi estimate, which is the probability of the test passing, which is 0.46, if I remember correctly. That's what they are all saying. 46% of the films, according to all three of the friends, pass the Bechtel test. The only thing that we're varying here is the sample size. So in conclusion, right, the larger the sample size, understood as n, the more insistent the likelihood function, which means it's going to insist more on the prior. So we see that the more insistent the likelihood, the more influence the data will hold over the posterior. And we can see that here uh, with the posterior now being um, drawn in green again. And we see that the prior were not varying, right? We said the prior is going to be the same one across all of them. And you can see that the data is very different. The curve of the data is very different to the, to the one of the, to the posterior when we have a smaller sample size. But as we keep incrementing data, so we go to 63 and then we go to n equals 99, the more we increase, the more data we collect, the more the posterior looks like the likelihood because the data is insisting, the likelihood, right, is insisting on the posterior. That insisting is the effect, I suppose, that it has, well, the effect, the influence that it holds over the posterior. So that's another key concept to, um, to, to sort of understand and reflect on. And then um, we move on to, okay, so now we saw the effects of the prior. Now we saw the effect of the sample sizes it's going to have on our posterior. Let's discuss the balance that we have to have between the prior and the data. So these grid of plots, let me zoom in a little bit so that it's more easily seen here. So this grid of plots is going to illustrate the balance between that posterior, uh, between the posterior model, no, the balance that the posterior model strikes between the prior and the data. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. So each row is going to correspond to a unique prior model, and each column is going to be different sample sizes. So columns is going to be columns are going to be sample sizes and rows are going to be priors. They're just comparing um, different random priors, well, not random, but you know, different degrees of uh, the, the parameters in the, in, the, uh, in the priors, sort of to see how much it would affect. And the likelihood's insistence and correspondingly the data's influence over the posterior increases with the sample size, which is exactly what we saw. So if we see that here, Remember that sample sizes are on the columns. We go from 13 to 99 again, and we're gonna see that the more data that we collect, the more the likelihood is going to resemble the, uh, the posterior. And that can be seen much more evident, I suppose, when we have the, um, this prior, the middle prior, um, which is going to be the feminist prior, if I'm not mistaken, which is, it doesn't have a lot of variability like this one, right? Like the, the flat prior is going to have the majority of variability, or it's going to have a large variability, as opposed to the first prior, which is going to be very constrained or has very little variability. So it's going to be like, in terms of variability, right in the middle. But you can actually see how much the sample size, the, um, the likelihood is looking like the posterior, the more we uh, 
collect data. The same thing can be seen when we have a very constrained prior. Um, the more data we collect, the more they look like. Um, the procedure is going to look like more and more like the likelihood. So the data. Um, so that's with the data. And then with the priors, again, the same thing, right? Uninformative priors, zero effect on the posterior. What's affecting really here is the data. That's what we can see in the lower row. The data is really influencing 100% the posterior. And then, um, and then the more informative it is, so the less variability it has, the more um, weight it's going to have. So the series is going to be right in between the uh, likelihood and the prior. I over explained this, I think, but this is very interesting to understand because when we start building our own models, which is what I've been doing actually mo for most of this year, sometimes you're like, what prior should I use? How is it going to affect my posterior? So if, it doesn't matter what model you're doing, as long as you understand these concepts, you're gonna then you're gonna start 100% with an uninformative prior. If you have a lot of data, so you collected thousands of data points, or if not thousands, hundreds of data points, then it's okay if you use. Well, I don't know if it's okay, but even if you use an informative prior, all of that data is going to influence the posterior. So these, these, these concepts are, are very important, I suppose. And then I like that this, um, so if we use the, the, um, the package, what is called base model? What is that package called? Let me just check. Um, the book, yeah, the base rule. Rule. Yeah. yeah, that package. I love it because if we start playing with this plot beta binomial, and I suppose they have the same one for, um, for other um, for other distributions, for other conjugate distribution, you can sort of start seeing and playing with the data. That's what I did here. I just input some data, and then you can sort of start doing that, and then getting the the tables. And I love that because um, this helps you sort of understand these concepts, right? I love that. I love that when they when they include that. Then in chapter four four one. What they do is they connect all of these concepts that we saw with theory, and the authors call it mathematical. And they sort of go through all the equations. I skipped that part just so that, because I felt like what we saw with the graphs was, I don't know, very straightforward. We didn't really have to go through the equations. But if you feel like you have to, or you would like to go through the equations, then, um, where is that thing here? Then you can go through that section, 432, and then you can see it's very straightforward and um, it doesn't have a lot of crazy math, actually. It's just, it's very simple, I, I, I suppose. But then um, we sort of, here, we go to the last part, which is going to be the sequential analysis or what does it mean to have evolving um, an evolving model that can be updated as we add more and more um, data. So let me see here. Okay, so what the authors are saying in the in this book section is that um, let's see, we examine the increasing influence of the data and the diminishing influence of the prior on the posterior as more and more data can come in as you add more and more data. Let's say you started with, with 100 data points and then you went again to the field and you collected more data and then you're adding 50 more. So that's what, what this means with adding more and more data. So consider the nuances of this concept, which means that as more and more data come in, that means that the idea that data collection and thus the evolution in our posterior understanding happens incrementally. So we can update our model and update our posterior by adding more data. So sequential Bayesian analysis, also known as Bayesian learning, is defined as 
In a sequential Bayesian analysis, a posterior model is updated incrementally as more data come in. With each new piece of data, the previous posterior model reflecting, reflecting our understanding prior to observing this data becomes the new prior model. And if I remember correctly, in the first chapter, um, they had, I don't think we're gonna, I'm gonna be able to go to the first one here. Yes. So here you can see exactly that. So we start with a prior and we start with a set of, set of data, a set of data, yeah. And then we derive a posterior. We add more data, which is exactly what they're saying here, and we update the posterior, and then we add more data, and then we update the posterior. So that's the sequential analysis that they were uh, sort of talking about. Let's go back. Um, And just so that we are clear on these two other um, sort of key points in sequential analysis that the data order is invariant. So it doesn't matter if we start with the more recent data uh, or if we start with the oldest data set collected. And the final posterior only depends upon the cumulative data. It doesn't matter the order in which we input that into the model. And that's it. That's all I have. Then we are, you're going to be able to see um, cohort one and cohort two videos in case um, some of their explanations are going to be, you know, much better than, than the one that I went through here. And, um, and then that's it. That's all I have, you guys. Today I did finish the chapter, which is great. Anyone has any questions or any? Um, I don't know comments about this chapter. Let me stop sharing. I'm going to try to add these notes to the repository because the notes that were available as of now. They are not in the repo, in the GitHub repo for R4DS. Um, yeah, so, but I, I, I made these ones myself. So I'm going to talk to John and see if he can merge them um, so that you guys can have access to the, to the notes. Other than that, I don't know if anyone has any comments or something else. It seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> great. So you um so that's great, Diana. You're not new to base analysis, right? You started doing some models, if I remember. Yeah. Um. I think it's always good to like learn more about priors because they're always kind of confusing. Yes, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's. I mean, it's always good to start from the basics. I I like this book actually. I've read so many more. Not that I understand this a hundred percent, but I feel like the more I read it, the and in different formats, the more I understand it. Yeah, it helps. You guys. Yeah. Yeah, it helps hearing different people explain it. <laughs> that too. That's true. That's true. It helps it when someone explains it to you differently and when you read it differently, right? Because different authors have like different ways of explaining it. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, if, if anyone has any other question, if not, then we can meet next week for chapter five. Sounds good. All right, then let's <laughs> let you had something to say, Aloha Femi? No, I said we'll see you next week. Thank you. All right. See you next week, you guys. Take care. Bye.